My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name is Jeffrey Can and the host of this podcast. And today I'm joined by a good friend of mine, uh, all the way from London, Nish Kotecha. Nish, how are you this morning? Very well, very well. Um, <laughs> battling against the coronavirus panic. <laughs> yes, for the, if you, I'm not sure when this podcast will uh, be released, but um, temporarily we are dealing with coronavirus uh, at the moment. The Americans have just announced that they are closing the border to uh, uh, all travel from uh, Europe into the, the United States, which is quite a uh, that's quite a, a statement. Um, are you barred from traveling now? And I mean, what's happening in London? Are you? Are you? Are no, you it's ex- the UK is excluded. We are not part of uh, the Schengen visa um, area, which which always was traditional mainland Europe rather than the UK. Um, and I guess with Brexit, we're barred anyway from being roped into uh, European statements or European restrictions. Mm. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if we are all part of it at some point in the next few weeks. But it was a very bold statement from Trump uh, last night. Yeah, very significant. And of course, uh, let's so let's turn our attention though to the real purpose of this uh, uh, podcast this morning, which is to learn a bit more about um, uh, Finboot, which is a, a tech startup based in London and Barcelona, uh, of which you are the uh, uh, one of the executive leaders there. Um, but let's begin, though, first with a bit about your background, because you have a very interesting background for a tech entrepreneur. <laughs> yes, thank you. And, and firstly, Jeffrey, thank you for inviting me to uh, to uh, be part of your podcast, which I listen to regularly. So thank you very much. Um, I, I have two, um, I guess two, the way I define it is I had two careers. I'm in my second career now. My first career was um, in investment banking after I graduated from the London School of Economics. And uh, I spent um, um, quite a, a long, um, a long road in investment banking, working with banks such as BZW, which was Barclays Investment Bank, J.P. Morgan, and Lehman Brothers. Um, and I left well before the crash. Before you asked, oh, I was, um, I was going to ask that. <laughs> Did you live through that? But you, you left, so saw the writing on the wall. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think my vision. Uh, glass was uh, was was you know um, I left w- about six years before the crash so so um, well before uh, even the seeds were starting to be sown for kind of financial destruction in 2008 but uh, but during my time I had a, a fantastic uh, uh, lucky uh, career I think is probably the best way of putting it I had the opportunity to work with some amazing companies I used to lead and head up capital market equity capital market operations um, so I spent the first part of my life focusing on Asian companies, did a lot of work in um, in China, in Hong Kong, in um, uh, India, uh, which is one of my uh, kind of focus markets. Um, I also worked on large transactions um, uh, from our base um, in the UK for, um, and, and in the sector, in the oil and energy sector, I actually was part of a team that led the privatization of British Energy, which was... Um, one of UK's largest uh, electricity generation companies. Mm. Um, at the time, it operated eight former UK state-owned nuclear power stations and one coal-fired uh, power station. And we took that private in, thinking back, to 1996. Um, and the other deal that I that, uh, that uh, took about six months of my life uh, was advising Lord Brown at BP, who was tremendous to work with. But Lord Brown at BP on the purchase of Amoco, oh, uh, right. the first probably most significant at its time uh, cross-border um, acquisition. I think he bought Amoco. sometime, wasn't it? Exactly. It was 98, yeah. Yeah. and I think it cost about $50 billion. Mm. Um, but it was an absolute groundbreaking uh, transaction and, you know, building the bridge between UK and, and US and, and all of the 
um, value creation opportunities, yeah. synergies, but also the political issues that we had to deal with at the time with, you know, who would run the business? Was it a U.S. <laughs> business? What is a U.K. business? Um, and you, I remember you, you can see You can see how the, that falls apart when you look at the d- disastrous uh, Nissan situation with um, – oh. Uh, Carlos, in Japan. yeah, right, Carlos absolutely. Goes, goes on, yeah, exactly. And in fact, from from my memory, one of the most uh, telling questions was this um, long term shareholder of BP at the AGM in '98 in this packed room with all the with the chairman and board of directors in the room, and he put his hand up and he said, "Will the the bright torch of Amoco burn brighter than the <laughs> BP Sun?" <laughs> That was a, a tough question in a board session. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so my second, uh, my second career, I left banking to become an entrepreneur. Hmm. And this is my third uh, business that I've uh, had the pleasure of being involved in. And as you said earlier, I'm the chairman and co-founder of Finboot. Um, my um, my previous entrepreneurial journey has looked at. Um, investment banking, corporate finance, uh, advisory, sitting on boards of companies, helping advise them on their financial strategy. Um, and then I went off to India for 10 years and I built a retail bank for the poor um, oh. as an agent, uh, an agent bank um, to solve um, the question of financial inclusion and financial literacy um, amongst those who we leave behind in our society. That's about 4 billion people who mm. don't readily have access to banking services, but they don't just need access. They need to be taught and be given the confidence of how to use them. So I yeah, made um, that my mission and went off and spent 10 years in India building that business. Yeah, there's a whole, uh, I mean, we, we don't think about it in Western societies too much, but uh, you're right. Pretty ba- basic things we all take for granted and understand as, uh, uh, concepts like insurance have no no meaning in there's no the societies have no experience with even financial products exactly. like that so they don't they don't know how to value them don't understand how you price them don't understand why you'd pay for something that might not you might never cash in on like why, why would you do that so you have to absolutely educate and if, in fact go one step if you go one step back sorry mm-hmm. um imagine you know those are the problems when you're taking a decision to purchase a product assuming that you can access it and it's affordable mm. but imagine a a simple thing like a bank branch today, which is full of bars on windows and marble floors, because yeah. that's the that's respect we give to bankers. But someone who is a beggar on a street will never walk into a bank branch mm. and be able to access a product that they can offer. Yeah. So you've got to redesign a very complex supply chain from customer facing upwards. And that deals with social issues as well as financial uh, issues as well as education. Well, let, let's turn to the, the your latest endeavor, though, Finboot, which is, a uh, as I mentioned at the to- uh, start of the podcast, a tech startup with uh, offices uh, based in London and Barcelona. You're on the, you're the London side, and I think your background in capital uh, markets is actually quite an asset to a tech startup um, because cash needs and financing needs are important. Um, but uh, t- t- tell, tell me a little bit about Finboot, what it actually is, the company, and and then most importantly, what what is the bis- uh, the, the business problems that uh, you know as an entrepreneur you're seeing need to be solved? Sure. And uh, so we we sat down, um, we being myself and uh, uh, and my four sorry th- four co founders in total, three um, the other three sat down back in '96, and we tried to identify the trajectory or, and the adoption curve of blockchain. Now, um, I don't know how many of you understand or, or know about blockchain. And unfortunately, when you look online, there's lots and lots of different definitions. But mm. I think of blockchain in a, in a very simple way, that instead of sending data to each other, which we do every day, I mean, the most um, uh, popular uh, ERP system used in every industry is email. That's how we communicate. And that overtook paper. That's how we used to communicate. Um, and with email, we are sending each other a copy of a document. We are taking version four and sending on version five. And we may not even change the titles. It remains version four. But we are sending on a copy each time. And at some point in time, we are making business decisions, capital decisions based on 
the documents that we are seeing, the emails that we are using. Mm. And there are problems. Problems appear every single day. We rely on these. We make erroneous decisions, incurs costs. It clogs up the system. Um, and there's got to be a better way of doing this. And blockchain is the technology that provides that solution. And in, in essence, it's uh, we talk about distributed nature of the ledger. But all that means is that we can all operate by looking at a set of documents that are central. And those documents are the original documents. They are unhackable or no one's managed to hack so the far. blockchain yeah. database to mm. date. Yep. Okay. And by being unhackable, once they're stored on the blockchain, they are immutable, right? Now, you can look at that with two ways. You can say it's fantastic if we as an organization, both internally and externally, can look at um, our, our uh, information, whether it's certificates of, of, um, of origin of a product. So in, in oil and gas, it could well be certificate confirming the origin of a oil, uh, barrel, or it could be a certificate confirming the source of of energy that is delivered to a customer. Mm. Um, if you're, do you really want to look at a copy, or do you want to know that what the screen and um, through the screen that you have, you are viewing the original document, and as the documents get stored, as the product moves through its supply chain, you end up with history, and that depth of history gives you trust in that product. Now, that trust today is being demanded by consumers, by regulators, by capital providers. Now, we sat down in 90, sorry, in 2006, uh, sorry, apologies, 2016. Mm. You got me thinking back to my banking days. 2016. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and realized that actually the power of blockchain would have one major drawback, and that is it's a complex technology that requires a different kind of development resource. Yeah. What does that mean? It's expensive and it takes a lot of time. Yeah, it does. It's that, holding back. One of the things holding it back is development. Is the uh, is that it's just too too nerdy, if you like. It's too 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 nerdy yeah, and yeah. complicated as it stands today. Absolutely. Well, look, it was it, it started life in two thousand eight. Mm. You know, we're we're twelve years into its in, into its uh, um, incarnation, even though. Many computer science professors will tell you distributed ledger technology existed 30 years ago. Mm. It's only really come to the fore uh, uh, since 2008 and the financial crisis. Mm. But the, the adoption of blockchain into a large enterprise, which may today most likely be struggling with digitization strategies anyway, mm. we realized that this was a huge opportunity for Finboot and for, uh, for our direction. So we, we, we took on board the challenge to build a platform, which we called Marco. Marco in Spanish means frame. A platform that could easily configure and easily adapt to any type of supply chain, value chain environment that would deliver you the blockchain technology, the blockchain capability, but wouldn't require anything more than a business user saying, Step one, we do this. Step two, we do this. Step three, we do this. Step mm. four, I collect this. Step five, yep. it goes. That's all that's required to deliver blockchain capability directly to the hands of our enterprise customers using our platform. So if you think of, you know, if I could distill that, I would say you, you, you've, to a degree, denertified. <laughs> I'm going to coin that term, hashtag denertify uh, exactly. blockchain. Uh, that means that companies who are looking for or are considering um, uh, solutions in their business for various kinds of problems related to things like copying data and duplicating data uh, would be able to use um, business existing business and analysts to develop solutions, not have to go recruit uh, expensive consultants or uh, software developers. So it sounds like it would accelerate uptake, adoption, do proof of concepts very quickly, pilot very quickly, uh, just to, to kind of see th how it would work. Is that is that basically the storyline? Absolutely. And, um, and, and you mentioned uh, two things that are very important. One, the technology needs to be usable by the existing resource capability of an enterprise. Uh, precisely, if yeah. not, 
you then struggle for talent, blockchain developer talent, which many enterprises are just not going to be able to attract. Yeah. Right. Whether it's by cost or scarce resource. Number two, the platform needs to be agile. Right. And by agile, I mean that once we, from what we've seen of technology adoption, once you develop a POC and an enterprise in its business department gets a chance to play with the technology, to mm. understand it, um, you know, what they would like to change, what they'd like to add, some of the usability barriers, which you can only understand once you're given a chance to see it in action. Mm. Then you make the right changes and move it into production. If So two things. One is that POC must be easily creatable, which is what our platform enables. And number two, from POC to a full production system, has to be quick because these supply chains are dynamic. So to f- once you fit uh, uh, fit it to a particular process curve, you know you may own, you may you, you can't take you six months to to make those configurations because by which time the process curve has changed. Mm. So you need to be able to make fast, speedy um, um, adoption and and reconfiguration of the technology to enable high usability. And that can only happen if you have a very agile, very configurable product. And so we deliver this product uh, using SaaS, software as a service. So we're constantly keeping it up to date for our customers at the back end, mm-hmm. making sure that they are simply seeing a web app or a smartphone app that is collecting data, that is interfacing with their employees, interfacing with their customers, and building behind the scenes a very rich um, tapestry of blockchain secured data which ultimately proves the value of that asset well let's actually turn to this question of where the value proof is because um the you know oil and gas especially these days with oil prices having collapsed just this past week um again uh, the industry is uh, not exactly um cash rich and therefore uh, cost and productivity opportunities uh, will be very mu- much on the minds of the uh, of the industry leaders. Um, and so, what kinds of business problems um, do you see out there in oil and gas that um, that 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 are solvable or could be solved with uh, with this kind of technology? So, one of our uh, first um, customers who um, was very interested in understanding the opportunity that blockchain technology brought to their business um, was Repsol, um, a Spanish uh, oil and energy group. Mm. Um, And we've been working with them now for coming on three years, and and they've been absolutely fantastic. Um, They've been fantastic because they really opened the question by saying, "Let's, let's both decide on some problems that we, we, we feel blockchain could help with, but we won't know till we actually try it out. Yeah, it's a bit of proof of concept um, and trials that, that often you have to do. Exactly. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to take that leap of faith. Now, it's all very well saying that, but if a leap of faith is going to cost you millions, I can understand why um, uh, you know pe- uh, many enterprises will bulk. But what we've created through our Marco platform is the ability to run those proof of concepts at a fraction of, of those kinds of prices and a fraction of what our competitors are doing because they're building bespoke solutions. We are reconfiguring our platform and it's a very different approach. Yeah. It's for way much faster actually. Technology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Much faster, more agile and a much lower price point, which yep. enables you to try and fail or try and succeed. But you'll end up with a system that is, that is really configured for you, but it's configured by reconfiguring our platform. Mm. Um, now, what their their first user case that we identified was one in tracking um, samples of oil through the laboratories through its journey to becoming various petrochemical products, um, and we identified one strand of that uh, of that chain and looked at the uh, um, the current mechanism through which they they ran a tracking process of physical oil to digital word document to pdf to sending it through there mm. through various nodes within repsol and we created marco configured marco for this particular challenge 
and have now implemented Marco um, into laboratories and different refineries. And really, we are replacing what I said at the beginning, an email communication methodology. Now, if you receive an email with a certificate, you look at it, do you instantly, you know, do you um, trust it? Trust it? <laughs> how do you know it's how do you know it's not a copy of a or yeah, an earlier exactly. version of a certificate? And actually, we found that many times it's almost easier to recheck than to check the um, validity of what you receive by email. So human nature is you find the supply of the supply chain process slowing down because people are duplicating work, duplicating effort. Um, and you end up with a, a more costly, slower exercise. Now, if by implementing our, our blockchain um, capability through Marco into these laboratories and refineries, um, what we did is we said to lab technicians, instead of uploading that certificate onto email, just drop it into this web app. Same kind of movement, you know, no more steps, just as easy. And what they don't need to know is that certificate is then blockchain stored. It's immutable. It's all hidden in the background. You're not, you're, they're not having to face up to uh, even understanding what blockchain is, really. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, we can configure the window to look just like an email, um, uh, you know, screen if they wanted to. You yeah. know, it, it really should be absolutely no difference if not easier just to use our application versus what they use today so what was the what was the error rate or the what was the 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 pain if you like uh that that email imposed on this process and i'm going to gather i'm going to guess it's uh you know i can't trust their certificate so i asked for it a second time um i lost their certificate um joe 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 emailed the certificate but then he's on leave and now i've got questions and i can't get them answered and so now i'm waiting and waiting and waiting and is that the kind of process pains that that um that labs might be experiencing in this area absolutely and add to that for all of those reasons i just had to retest it <laughs> which adds cost and um and and uh, of no uh, no incremental value yeah, that's a really Absolutely. interesting point. Uh, important point, uh, Nish, because the oil and gas industry frequently quote loses data or has the data but lo- has misplaced it or can't tell which data is most current, and and therefore let's just go redo the redo the work. This happens all the time in seismic uh, data collection. Can't can't find the original seismic data, so I just go and shoot it again, which can Absolutely. can cost can cost millions. Well, and and in the case of Repsol, and um, you know you're. If you type in um, into into your search engine, um, Block Labs, which is a white label um, uh, brand we gave to the product Marco that we delivered to Repsol. Mm. So if you type in Block Labs, Repsol, Finboot, there's a press release from uh, uh, from Repsol confirming the kind of benefits they're seeing through that early adoption of our technology. Mm. And they estimated that just on one strand of product movement, they could save for about 400,000 euros um, in the first year alone. Um, Now, that more than pays for their implementation of a technology and their investment into the innovation. Um, But if I can add, one side of um, the the opportunity is a cost-saving opportunity. So think of using this type of technology as part of your digitization path. Um, maybe it replaces some of your ERP existing systems. Mm. Marco integrates with existing ERP systems like SAP. So it makes, so it can be used very complementary with your existing ERP um, systems, right? That's a big advantage, um, actually, because there's, <clears throat> there's zero appetite in oil and gas to s- start uh, uh, replacing uh, these, these um, proven installed working enterprise uh, technologies like, like SAP, among others. Absolutely. So mm-hmm. we're all about complementary. Yeah. You know, precisely. and um, but I would add the other side of the equation, which is on one, one hand, you're saving costs because you're making things more efficient mm. and you're being able to rely on data that you are seeing, which you cannot do with any other technology today. Right? Um, because they um, work on- well, unless I mean the, the alternative, I suppose, is that and I'll, let's go back to Block Labs as an example. Repsol could stand up a you know some sort of 
dedicated computer system that does things like track all of these certificates. Uh, but they'd have to enroll their entire supply chain onto that platform. Building the database system itself is a highly specialized um, problem to solve. It's not like you can go to the market and say, hey, give me, the, give me your lab- laboratory certification sample testing tracking me- uh, tool. <laughs> like that, that doesn't exactly. exist. So, so how do you do something quite quickly to kind of build up a, a workflow that integrates with existing systems and creates immutability over the data and poof, blockchain steps into the, into the void? So it's Absolutely. Pretty, yeah. It's a good question. Very powerful um, answer. And, hmm. and, and I'd just add one thing. Remember hmm. that, yes, we have database functionality that allows us to invite people to um, be part of a spreadsheet, a Word document, and so on. But again, that data, the, or, the administration of that data is centralized. Yes. So if you're taking that data <clears throat> to a regulator, which oil and energy companies do on a regular basis, mm-hmm. and incidentally, before Repsol gave a green light to the implementation of Block Labs, they showed it to a regulator. We demonstrated the product. We got a thumbs up. Mm. Um, but the point here is that the decentralized nature of blockchain means that um, the data um, cannot be manipulated by a single mm. authority. Mm. That's the value, right? And just to remind your listeners, what we are talking about here is an enterprise permissioned um adoption of blockchain so we're not talking about the public blockchain where or bitcoin where in that case trading yeah. of bitcoin yeah, we're talking yeah. about permissioned private blockchain infrastructure and not cryptocurrency that's the other uh, key um, message this is about uh, track and trace and you know you think about it that the, the track and trace potential in oil and gas is very high like we what the industry does not have uh track and trace uh immutable record keeping for instance on its emissions or its uh, use of water resources, or in the case of uh, crude oil, just the tr- international uh, trading of crude. Um, there, there is uh, no tracing of crude oil uh, through uh, through systems uh, cross borders. There's no tracing of crude. So you, uh, the that that it's all done with systems. But if you were looking for um, a, a proof of of source or origin of a hydrocarbon product particularly in the world where you're imposing sanctions on countries, uh, as the U.S. Uh, frequently does, uh, it, the uh, absence of uh, provability uh, means that every barrel can be at least a little bit suspect around where it's come from. Correct. And, and if we go one step further, if that was a volunteer, if, if oil and energy companies yesterday were willing to take leadership in their mm. industry by giving more data to um to the marketplace on a volunteer basis voluntary basis mm. tomorrow consumers regulators capital providers are demanding more transparent evidence-based data yep. of the renewable characteristics of of the product they're yep. providing um circle economy facts and evidence um a failure to provide it is cutting off these companies from from the ability to grow or invest. Yeah, you know, ultimately driving their valuation lower. It's going to become toxic for an oil and energy company not to operate at the highest threshold of transparency. Now, that doesn't mean everyone sees everything. Mm. It means step one that you have a database that evidence is everything. And then to those different audiences, you can provide the data and the evidence they require to support your business operations. When you think about the uh, EU, for instance, moving to uh, carbon neutrality uh, by 2050, the amount of evidence that all companies across Europe will be looking to, are going to need to prove that they are contributing to carbon neutrality or if they're not contributing to carbon neutrality, how they're doing so off-continent, for instance, to, so that there's a planetary balance. Uh, this trace, track and trace requirement is going to become very, very real. And that's just on emissions uh, in the atmosphere. The, in North America, some of the challenges here are, are more water-based, uh, which is the kind of the scarce resource. 
let, let's just turn to a little bit about, uh, uh, as we wrap this uh, uh, conversation up, uh, uh, Nish, let's turn to uh, this question of um, uh, uh, interesting lessons that you've picked up as you've, you know, you've worked with uh, Repsol and other large companies with this technology. What, what, what are the, some of the takeaways that you would, you'd, you'd share to other entrepreneurs? Um, number one um, is that it's certainly not easy um, <laughs> to uh, to um, open the doors to these very large um, companies. Uh, I have to say, I feel we were slightly fortunate um, by um, by uh, knocking on the door of of one that took a very innovative um, and, and let's try it approach. Um, however, what I what I would say today is we are finding more and more oil executives at all levels of a business, C-level, all the way through the organization, willing to um, or understanding that they must now adopt an evidence-based approach to what they are doing. Mm. They, they, you know, this industry lacks digitization. And as part of that drive towards digitization, they're re- realizing that it's not the digital technologies that, you know, other industries were adopting yesterday, but they need to jump, you know, into the future and make sure that they are resilient mm. and future proof because they're going to be under the, the greatest degree of um, uh, of uh, scrutiny, scrutiny yeah. Uh, yeah. from from a journalist all the way through to a consumer. So mm. digitization requires data to be collected at all levels. Um, it Today, that data is not available at all levels. I mean, you know, an old refinery will give you data at only certain points of the of through the chain and the processing uh, um, uh, path. Um, but that doesn't matter because if you're not capturing what you can get today, you can't build it. You can't mm. build new thresholds. You can't bring everyone up to the same kind of reporting standards. And those reporting standards are either survival or failure of your business. Mm. So um, they they stay the course and keep at it, uh, but clearly it sounds like there's a groundswell of uh, interest building in this, uh, driven by social pressures, regulators, uh, activists, and so on to uh, help the industry up its game. Um, so it's going to be very interesting times for, for the industry going ahead. Um, Nish, if people wanted to learn more about Finboot, where where do they where do they go? What's your what's your website um, address? So- it's finboot.com um, and you can also, um, I refer you to some really interesting articles which are very relevant uh, for this uh, topic. So we mm. recently um, written about in Forbes, which looked at how oil and gas companies can use blockchain. So if you type in finboot Forbes, I'm sure that article will will, um, will uh, appear. It was written by Mike Scott uh, back in February. Um, but uh, the best place is our website. Um, and then feel free to email us di- directly. Our details are all on the website. So at finboot.com. Yeah. And that's F I N B O O T, finboot.com. Uh, uh, Nish, this has been uh, fantastic. Thank you very much for uh, appearing on the podcast and uh, good luck uh, in your uh, journey to help the oil and gas industry digitize. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, and thank you for listening to all your listeners. So that concludes today's uh, podcast show and uh, uh, Digital Oil and Gas will return in a week uh, time. So tune back in. If you liked uh, this uh, podcast, be sure and click the like button so that other uh, interested uh, listeners can find this podcast. And until next time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil & Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.